We're glad that you've joined us today and hope that we all prosper in his word. Let's have some prayer. Mighty God, we thank you and we praise you. Help us, God, as we study to gain an understanding and wisdom and knowledge and to be effective in every ministry that you've called us to. Cause us, oh God, to hear your voice, to know your ways, and to be a blessing to everyone we touch. And we ask that you do it in the name above every name, in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. All right, well, so uh, we just finished up with uh, verse 17 in Matthew chapter five, and we're talking about living in the light and living in the darkness, and we're kind of contrasting those, those ideas. Uh, so we're, we're just coming to the kingdom of God and we have to learn how to live in this new ethos and in this new value system. And what is important in the kingdom may not be valued in the world and vice versa. So if we've come in as an adult from the world, then we have a lot of reframing to do and a lot of adjustment to do. And our knowledge base is full of things that used to work and we thought were real uh, and true, but now we have to replace our knowledge base so that our thought life can prosper and our imagination or our capacity for vision will, uh, will be enhanced or be, be godly, all right? And we wanna please God and we wanna look to God as our ideal and the word of God as our ideal. And so we are less and less socially conformed and more and more, uh, because social, even in the church, Social conformity is a problem sometimes simply because even as we are being redeemed, we are still flawed and broken and, and, and our, our, our ideal and our vision is, uh, is Jesus. And so we need to look to him, look above the heads of everybody around you and look to Jesus. And uh, the age old question, what would Jesus do? Well, that's not a bad question. Here, let me adjust this right quick. Okay, forever making adjustments. <clears throat> All right, so uh, we'll start here again and, uh, and let's pursue this a little further. I hope you're doing well and walking in the blessings of God today. At this stage in the Bible study, we have, we have moved into uh, discipleship and this is no longer evangelism. We came out of that with the last presentation of the gospel. Uh, if you're here, part of this and you don't have the Holy Ghost and you've never been baptized in Jesus name, understanding this and relating to this other than academically is practically impossible for you because you can't understand the ways of the spirit without the spirit. So you first thing you need to do your first assignment today, get the Holy Ghost, get the Holy Ghost like they did in the book of Acts. You'll know you got it because you'll speak in tongues. And uh, thereafter, you talk in tongues every day as a normal part of your prayer experience. And then uh, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. You have effectively obeyed uh, the mandate of uh, John chapter three, verse five with Jesus and Nicodemus, born of the water, born of the spirit. Now you're off to the races on your growth curve, living for God. And so our discussion in this, in this study is about to differentiate between living in darkness and living in light, what we used to be or what the world is and what we are. Now, sadly, you can get baptized in Jesus' name and uh, filled with the Holy Ghost and have your uh, growth uh, process severely retarded by, uh, by maintaining the, uh, the value system of the world never replacing the value system of the world with the value system of the kingdom of God. If you don't effectively do that, you'll be like Israel in the wilderness who they got out of Egypt, but Egypt never got out of them. That's the bottom line on that. So you have to, you have to get out of Egypt and that's good. That's your initial repentance. And, and they came through the water, so they were baptized and they came under the cloud. Paul says they were baptized in the cloud and in the sea. And uh, so all of those are excellent things, but you've got to keep growing and you've got to keep developing because you have to get Egypt out of you or else you'll be singing like they were, oh, for the flesh pots of Egypt or, oh, you brought us into the wilderness to die. And you know, here we are, we're dying in the wilderness. And, uh, 
and you should have just left us in Egypt like we told you, and uh, were there no graves in Egypt? And we knew, we knew we should have not listened to you, Moses, and gone, well, you know, all of that, all of that. Uh, well, that's because Egypt is still in them. And they're not, thank God, I'm out of Egypt. They're not, thank God, this is hot and dry and dusty, but we're with God and we're on a journey and here we go. And I'd rather die in the wilderness than be a slave in Egypt. Now that's gotta happen to you. You've gotta get to that place and you've gotta arrive there. If you ever start singing the songs of, oh, I wish I was back in the bar, or I wish I was back in Catholicism, or I wish I was back in the bondage of, if you ever start singing that song, even if you have the Holy Ghost and been baptized in Jesus' name, it's not gonna do you any good at all. Now, um, oh, by the way, uh, by the way, if you want to uh, ask a question or make a comment, you can text me or you can uh, post it on the live chat on the uh, live stream. So uh, we can talk about um, we can talk about anything relative to this study. So you have to plug in and you have to grow. Now, salvation has been distilled in these modern days of whatever the world's view of Christianity is which is not a biblical view of Christianity, right? So um, Christianity's kind of been co-opted by uh, all sorts of different movements and ideologies, and, and they are not necessarily the biblical representation of the church or God's kingdom. So you have to ferret through all of that, and you have to, you have to let the word of God be your... Uh, be your lens through which you vet every idea. But in the world's Christianity, salvation has been distilled down to just believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. And once you do that, well, you've got salvation and now you can't ever lose it. You're once saved and you're always saved and man, we got you tucked in and you're all good to go and you don't have to worry. But that's not the biblical representation. You have to come out of Egypt, you have to be born again of the water and of the spirit, and then you've got to grow. You've got to keep growing. And you've got to, if God gives you talents, you've got to reproduce them. If you bury them, and we've all, I'm just referring to lessons we've already had. We've already studied the parables. They are extremely illustrative of life in the kingdom. And what God gives you, you have to grow that in your life or you are a um, vineyard that doesn't bring forth good fruit, or you're a cultivated field that doesn't bring forth the desired fruit of God. And you have to be very attentive to the man that took the talent and hid it and came back to God and said, here's what you gave me. I didn't grow it, but I didn't lose it either. God had him bound hand and foot and cast out into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, uh, now, if he didn't go to hell, I'm a monkey's uncle. You know, uh, the parables are full of people going to hell. The bad fish, the tares, <laughs> you know. Uh, it, they are, and it's weeping and gnashing of teeth and outer darkness and fire that doesn't die and worm that is, the worm that doesn't die and the fire that is not quenched. It's, a, it's, it's so graphically descriptive of hell. So you have to understand that you start with God, but that's not the end of your experience. You have to keep growing in God. And yes, you can lose your salvation. Uh, like the prodigal son who leaves the father's house and goes to the pig pen. The father said he's dead and he's lost. And I don't care if you're a Southern Baptist, dead and lost means dead and lost, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and, well, okay. So, um, so you have to keep growing. And we don't, we're not living under a cloud of fear and condemnation and angst and all of that. It's a joyous journey. It's our Father's house. It's our Father's kingdom. We've come home and now we're growing. And I was, I was a child when I started. So now I have to grow up in the kingdom of God. And on the day that Moses dies, God takes him to the top of a mountain and shows him more vision. 
Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things, but one of the things that it is very glaringly uh, demonstrating to me is that on the day you die, there'll be fresh vision, more to see, more to do. You just ran out of life, you know? So the kingdom of God, it's, it's Isaiah 9 and 7. Uh, there is no end to the increase of his government and peace. Now that's in the earth at large, it's in the church, and it's in you as an individual. God's kingdom always keeps growing. It's the parable of the, of the, the, the leaven, and it grows. It's the nature of the kingdom of God to grow, to grow in you. And so you've got to grow yourself in God in every way. Come to God holistically, mind, body, and spirit. You grow, the church grows, the kingdom grows in the earth. All right, so we're moving through here now, and this is like, these are like growth lessons. These are like differentiations between the world and you now as a member of the kingdom of God. And so you're growing, you're building, you're seeing new things about who you were and what you're going to be. And you will always have things in you that are not like God because you're on your existential journey. You're broken, you're, you're Adamic, you're, you're, you're fallible. And so uh, as you grow, you see more clearly. The path grows brighter. We move from faith to faith, from glory to glory. And so uh, as you get into light, like in dim light, you see, okay. But when you get the glaring midday sun, uh, you, you see a whole lot more clearly. And, uh, and, and, you know, like people that are doing exotic, uh, highly technical work, like, like surgery and stuff, man, they have some powerful lights in those arenas and those, uh, ORs and you're glad of it because you don't want them working in a, in the dark, just kind of losing the losing their way in the soup, you know, you want them to be able to see clearly what they're doing. Well, that's how it is working for God. And where God is at the ideal, when Paul saw him on the road to Damascus, it was noon. It was bright Middle Eastern noontime sun. And Paul said there was a bright light. So it was brighter than the noonday sun. And when he looked up at it, it fried his eyeballs. He went blind. Now God's going to heal him. It's going to be a better ending, you know. But, but the idea is God is light. In him was life and the life was the light of men. John chapter 1. Uh, he is the father of lights above from whom comes every good and perfect gift and in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And he dwells in unapproachable light. So uh, th this is just a, uh, a hammering repetition throughout the word of God. The further you go, the closer you get to God, the more intense the light gets or the more perfectly you will be able to see. Well, it makes complete sense. So these lessons are differentiating between life and the darkness and life and the light. And it has to do with your apprehension, your perception, and your and your performance, what you do. Uh, so, all right. Think not that I am come. I'm come, I'm in verse 17, Matthew chapter five. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And so we as the church, we had a whole lesson uh, centered around on this rock, I'll build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then Paul, we are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. So that has to do with the word of God as per the prophets, the word of God as per the apostles and Jesus Christ, who is the bridge work between them two. He is the God of the Old Testament, but he's the Christ of the New Testament. And so uh, we, we have to deal with the Old Testament. So one of the, one of the um, whenever you present, uh, say, the, uh, the current Protestant mentality with a biblical uh, position that requires a certain type of behavior or action, they will always relegate that conversation to the Old Testament. 
Well, you're in the Old Testament. Uh, we're not in the law anymore. We're not in bondage in the law anymore. Well, that is a, that's a really um, empty and vapid and, um, and unaffected approach to the word of God. And it's theologically bogus because Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy it. I came to fulfill it. Now, when you're dealing with the Old Testament, and we've studied this before, so this is review, there are basically three ways <laughs> that things come from the Old Testament and emerge into the new. And uh, especially when you're in areas where God is telling Abraham or Moses or someone that this is an everlasting covenant. Uh, so you have to, or this will be an everlasting principle. So you'll have to really handle those with care. So your basic three ways are something comes from the Old Testament to the New Testament and is exactly the same. Like honor your father and mother, the first commandment with promise. It's, it, it's in the 10 commandments but it's also in the New Testament, honor your father and mother. And uh, so that's, that's the law. Oh no, well, yeah, that's the law. And you still have to do it in the New Testament. <laughs> and then uh, don't drink blood of all the things. It's kind of an interesting, strange thing. But when Noah gets off the boat, God's gonna let him have steak and meat to eat. And he says, but don't drink the blood, don't eat the blood. So it starts there, it's reiterated in the law of Moses, and then read Acts chapter 15. They're writing letters to the Gentile churches and they say, oh, by the way, don't drink blood. So it, it moves straight through, stays the same. Uh, the life is in the blood, don't drink the blood. There's heavy uh, symbolic importance there. And so it has to do with how you behave. So. If you've got a quart of blood in your refrigerator and you like to take a nip every now and then, stop it. Because it's true in the New Testament. Oh no, it was under the law. It's before the law. It's before the law. It's transdispensational. Trans it's before, it's at the time of Noah. So some things come through and stay the same. Some things, some things change by fiat. Jesus teaches and said, you've heard eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, forgive your enemy. Now, what, what happened there? God said, Old Testament, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Now, New Testament, let forgiveness reign. Have mercy on your enemies. Well, okay, so that changes. So some things change by fiat, by commandment but you have to know what does and what doesn't. That's, that's the premium and that's your responsibility. And then the third thing, things change as by typology or typological association, like the Lamb of God in the Old Testament sacrifice from Adam all the way to, uh, to the days of Jesus Christ uh, was a lamb, an animal sacrifice, but with Jesus, John said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world in John 1 and 29. And, uh, and the people turn and they expect to see, they're all Jews, they expect to see an animal, but they see a man. And that's the new teaching. And uh, Isaiah 53, he's wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace is upon him. And by his stripes are we healed. So he, as a lamb led to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. And uh, so Jesus now is the lamb of God, the high priest in the Old Testament, read Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. We've already done this, this is review, but... Um, the, the New Testament high priest is Jesus Christ. The Old Testament had a tabernacle. They had a temple. But now it's the temple of his body. And now it's the temple of your body, both corporately and individually. So you see some things change from Old Testament to New Testament by typological fulfillment. Some things remain the same and some things are changed by fiat or by commandment from God. So when he says, don't think I've come to destroy the law or the prophets, I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill, you need to know and understand some things in the Old Testament are gonna move through and will be the same for you 
as they were in the Old Testament. So do not just gratuitously say, if it looks like a commandment in the New Testament and somebody brings that to your attention, don't start squalling, oh, that's under the law because you sound, uh, you sound like someone who is totally unfamiliar with the word of God. Of course, there are rules and laws and statutes and commandments in the New Testament. There are rules and laws and statutes and commandments in your drive to work every morning and in everything else you do in your life. You're surrounded by those things. The idea that in the kingdom of God, there would be no definitions and no borders and no boundaries and no requirements is, is insanity. But it's that Protestant theology again that says works don't matter. What you do doesn't matter. So it can't have anything to do with something that is required of you. Well, sweetheart, the New Testament is full of requirements. And as long as you are bound to that Protestant theology, you will never be what God has called you to be. You'll never shoulder up under the, uh, the covenant and the yoke of the New Testament. And you probably won't ever be saved because you'll look at something like baptism and you'll say, it's just a work. It doesn't matter. Well, you're out of your mind. Jesus said, he that believes in is baptized shall be saved. And Jesus said, uh, you must be born of the water and of the spirit of you, or you can't enter in. And I mean, baptism is a mile wide and 10 miles deep all through the New Testament and the typology runs all the way back to the creation. Now, uh, you realize how insipid you sound when you say, oh, baptism doesn't matter. Peter says, baptism also now saves us. Ananias says it washes away your sins. Peter says it cleanses you. But you see, that's the pitfall that you're in when you embrace that standard Protestant theology of works don't matter. Well, they do. And they are the difference between being in the darkness or being in the light, staying in the light or retreating into the darkness. All right. So Jesus said, I haven't come to destroy the law or the prophets. I've come to fulfill them. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth shall pass away, um, not one jot nor one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Every dispensation points toward the next. And there are, there are thousands of typological things moving through the Old Testament, some so complex, I'm sure that we don't even see them, that are being fulfilled every moment in the, uh, in the present dispensation and uh, in the last dispensation to come. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men, so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. It matters what you do. You need to go out and trash your Protestant theology because it, it is a blinder on you in regard to the word of God. Uh, for I say unto you, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no, key, no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, the scribes and the Pharisees are a real problem and they don't understand the spirit of the law and they don't understand mercy and meekness and grace and goodness and they are absolutely sectarian and... Uh, of the Sadducees are absolutely secular in their approach and the Pharisees have become caught up in judgment and, and uh, scrutinizing everybody around them. They're the worst possible scenario for what religion can be. Uh, and so your righteousness has to. And so Jesus insulted them and contradicted them and offended them at every, at every turn. Um, verse 21, you've heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. Whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Now this means to murder. 
Obviously, this is the same God that sent them out to kill everybody in Jericho, everybody in Ai, right? Common theme in the Old Testament. Don't let anything that breathes live. And so, uh, but he says, in the law, thou shalt not kill. What does it mean? It means murder or kill with malice or treachery, all right? Because the same God sends them out to, uh, sends them out to kill. All right, so he said, that's how it was in the Old Testament. Uh, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, which means empty headed, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, you don't believe in God, shall be in danger of hellfire. So this is within the construct of the church, in the construct of the kingdom of God. Jesus is standing, he is an Old Testament rabbi teaching an Old Testament Israel. All the gospels are still under the law. We've already had that lesson. I can't recreate it for you here today. But he's teaching the value system of the New Testament or of the kingdom of God. And he says, I told you before, don't be a murderer. Now I'm just telling you, don't be a hater. Don't be a hater and don't say hateful things to people. Now he's talking about your, your brother with his brother. A brother is in the kingdom of God. Um, and to his brother, Raka. And also to his brother, even though it's unspoken here, thou fool. So taking hostile uh, adversarial positions to a brother in the Lord and to hate him or to speak abusively to him uh, brings you in jeopardy of your soul. Uh, he says, uh, you're in danger of hellfire. And, and so this, this is an alarming development. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that people that walk in the light treat others with respect and civility and kindness and gentleness and meekness and love. And when Jesus is talking to Pilate, Jesus is God. Pilate is a Gentile. He's a dog. He is, he is a representative of the mo one of the most debauched kingdoms in history, the Roman Empire. And Jesus speaks to him as he speaks to everybody. I mean, he doesn't mind having a straight up conversation with him. And to tell someone the truth is not, you don't have to be disrespectful and you don't have to be malicious. So when you deal with your brethren, you always deal with them with respect. Okay. Uh, I was, uh, I was involved in some, uh, in some private school uh, interactions back in our uh, experience in uh, Louisiana, and um, and and we we would attend uh, uh, like uh, Senate hearings or legislative uh, meetings and try to we were lobbying for favorable outcomes for private schools, for our church school and all, uh, because it doesn't hurt to, uh, to try to influence the, uh, the political ar arrangement when those persons involved in that can pass legislation that's gonna have long-term effect on your church school. So uh, we were in those meetings. We attended a meeting one night at a conservative Baptist church and uh, in that Senate subcommittee hearing, some of those individuals from that conservative Baptist church have, had stood up and made some allegations about some of, the, uh, uh, some of the bureaucrats or legislators that were, uh, that were involved in these proceedings. And um, there, was a, there was a lady there that was very professional and very... Uh, uh, civil in her approach to all of these church leaders, but she told them some very hard things, very straightforward things 
about the nature of this legislative business and about the nature of what they were trying to accomplish. And it really, it made them look foolish in that meeting. She, she uh, demonstrated to them how ignorant they were of some of these, uh, some of these processes and they were acting, um, they were acting in a very rude way and a very um, uninformed way in that public setting. Well, that night we went to a, a uh, political rally at a, at a church and I was amazed, I was astounded <coughs> because some of these preachers were getting up and one guy in particular, he said, I would like to take that lady and I'd like to bash her head against the wall and watch her brains run down the wall. <laughs> I nudged the guy next to me and I said, well, okay, where's the nearest exit? We have walked into a place where we have no business at all. And uh, this guy was purportedly a representative of a church or a theological uh, area of belief or Christianity at some level, but I'll just tell you, when you get involved, and, I, and I've seen some really nasty attitudes displayed by people in doctrinal discussions and people who have differences in doctrinal discussions. And I just wanna wave a red flag at you and warn you, you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're in danger of judgment. You say to your brother, you're an empty-headed man. <laughs> you're in danger of the council. But if you say you're a fool, you don't know God, you're in danger of hellfire. I wanna to suggest to you, there is nothing that we can't discuss and maintain civility and maintain the harmony how beautiful and how pleasant it is that brethren dwell together in unity. It's like the dew that falls on Mount Hermon. It's like the oil that ran down on Aaron's head. There's an anointing there when brethren dwell together in unity. But, but the idea here is we can talk about anything, but you don't forsake love and mercy and gentleness and goodness and kindness. You don't forsake the nature of the spirit what you're doing, you're reverting back to your old nature, to your murderous, Adamic, fallen nature, and, and in, a, in an arena of thought and discussion with your brethren, and this happens quite often when people run out of intelligent discussion, when they run out of something informed to say, then they, result, they resort to name calling, an angry, uh, uh, angry response. Okay, at any rate, there's no place for this in the light, in the kingdom of God. So be sweet, be kind, be civil. Um, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and remember that your brother has ought against you, leave your gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Don't, God, don't mistake this at all. God is telling you, I won't do business with you. Don't bring me a gift and worship me when you can't get along with your brother. All right, so here's the thing. First commandment, love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, strength. Second commandment, love your brother as yourself. And, um, and you, you love your brother as yourself, uh, you demonstrate by the way you behave with your brethren how you love God. The way I treat other people <coughs> demonstrates and evidences how deeply I love and respect God. Why is that? Well, because God loved them so much he died for them. God went to the wall for everybody you're ever gonna meet in your life. And he valued them and he paid the ultimate price for them. They are valuable because they are made in the image of God and because God paid the ultimate price for them. And so you can't live in the light 
and have ongoing bickering and feuding and ang and and uh, animosity toward uh, toward your brother in the Lord. And and I just I just want to tell you, you don't want to live in a church like that. You don't want to be that person because you can't be. You can't be the, the repository of the fruit of the Spirit and be the emissary of God in any effective way if you have, oh, hard, harsh, angry, uh, adversarial feelings and, and thoughts and words all the days of your life. You're more like those Pharisees he just talked about than you are like Jesus. And you've got to get that straightened out in your life. So leave the gift at the altar. Go get it right with your brother. That's John says in his epistle. He says, this is how we know that we've come from death to life, that we love the brethren. This is how we know that we, because we love the people of God. And that's something that ha has to happen. God loves his people. You want to be like him? You want to be close to him? Love people. I mean, we, we did the study in the parables about the lost things. He's trying to explain to the Pharisees why he spends time with publicans and sinners. They're not even in the church and they're, they're outside in need of the church. And he's, he teaches them about the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son. And in each occasion, that's what causes rejoicing in heaven. And that's what makes God happy. It's what makes the angels happy. And it's what makes the kingdom happy. <laughs> happy. So you can't have hard attitudes towards sinners, much less hard attitudes toward the people of God. You can't do it. You can't do that and be the people of God. And you say, well, that's just the way I am. That's just the way I've always been. Well, you miss one of the first lessons. He makes the, the crooked places straight and he makes the rough places he makes the rough places plain. He smooths you out, okay? So, and, and that comes in a lesson on repentance. So you gotta get that right. Go make it right with your brother. Go make it right with your brother. Well, no, you're not, agree. you're not gonna agree on everything, but are you so insecure? And are you so fragile in your confidence in the things of God and in the word of God, that if anybody's different from you in any way, you have to make them an adversary and you're angry at them and you deride them publicly or you, you know, that's not the kingdom of God. That's not living in light. All right, agree with thine adversary quickly while thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge and the judge deliver thee to the officer and thou be cast in prison. And verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence. God says, I'm not going to help you till thou hast paid the utmost farthing. Whatever your adversary is, it's not like, he's not saying agree with the devil and, and, and walk away from the principles of the kingdom of God. He says, agree with your adversary. Somebody that you meet that is against you or is uh, not... Uh, and, 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 and not uh, in compliance with you, and it makes you angry, whether it's someone, okay, you have a business deal with them, and you can't agree. Well, agree with them. Agree with them quickly. You owe a debt. Agree with them quickly. He said, because if it comes push to shove, and you get put in jail, I'm not coming to help you. You're gonna pay every farthing that you owe. <laughs> so because of your stubbornness and your pride or just because you have gotten in this heated altercation, don't, don't be that person. Don't get involved in angry uh, associations because of traffic problems or a fender bender or a business situation or somebody cuts you off in the line at Walmart or all of those things are extensions of your stinking pride. And you need to have, you need to be humble and you need to prefer your brother before yourself and okay. All right, now we're probably just gonna finish out this fifth chapter and not go any further with this, but it's, uh, it's the heart and soul of this. 
You have heard it uh, that it was said of them in old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. <clears throat> now we, we dealt with this when we were working on temptation way back at the garden. But I'll go through this again because quite often I, I'm, I'm dealing with someone and they'll say, well, uh, he looked on a woman, he, he's already committed adultery in his heart. It's just as bad as if he had committed adultery. That's not what Jesus is saying. And practically, you know that's not true. I mean, just try this. Uh, if your husband, if you're a woman, your husband comes home, or if you're a man, you come home to your wife. So whichever way this shoe fits. Um, the man comes home and says, honey, I saw a lady today and I was attracted to her and I, I, felt, uh, I felt attraction to her and I had a, a desire for her in a physical way. Uh, you come home and you say that. Well, the wife's obviously not gonna be happy with you and she may give you a lot of grief and she may be angry with you for a little while or something, however that works out. Uh, but it's typically not gonna be a, uh, typically you wouldn't come home and tell your wife that because it would make her upset. But if you did and she got upset, you come in the next day or in a different scenario and you say, honey, I saw a lady today and I was attracted to her and I followed her and we got together and we've had a full blown sexual experience. Now tell me those are the same. Tell me those are weighted the same before God or with you or in any sense of morality or ethics. They are not the same. Jesus is calling you to a higher level of spiritual experience. He's saying, keep your heart right. And he's telling you, don't, uh, if you, now here's the bottom line. Uh, it, men are attracted to women. So if a man sees a woman and his bell goes off, that's the language we use when we were talking about the, the study of temptation, lust, sin, and death. The bell goes off. Uh, well, that just means you're hardwired for that. And that is a natural human response. It doesn't mean that you're the spawn of the devil. I mean, God made you that way. You're attracted to women, which first, let me congratulate you that you're attracted to women. Uh, that bell should not be going off when you see men. All right. So, um, so you're attracted. That's how God made you. That is not sin. That's a biological response, all right? If you follow her with your eye and you begin to allow things to happen in your mind and in your spirit because of that, then Jesus says you've committed adultery in your heart. What really that has to do with is you're, you're taking the first step toward adultery and he's calling you to a higher level. He's saying, don't get, you just, you just, uh, Remember Job and say, I have a covenant with my eye. Why should I look upon a maid? You need to say that with your mouth. Turn your life, your body, your mind, your eyes away and go on about your business. Okay. Take control of the situation. Jesus is saying, don't let it, don't let it degenerate into uh, fantasy or imagination because that will get down in your heart. And perhaps he's saying that's the first step toward adultery. Covetousness is the first step toward stealing or thievery or maybe even murder, you know? So uh, don't take the first step. Be in control of yourself. He's calling you to a higher level. But I wanted to just mention that that is not the same thing. Uh, so uh, verse 29, and if you're right, I offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. It's profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that, uh, that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. This is a graphic illustration of how deadly serious it is that you continue to grow and that you overcome all of these things that are in you, built in you, that are not like God or things that were commonplace in your experience before in your, uh, in your life in the world or your life in the darkness. You've got to get better. 
He says, it'd be better for you to tear your eyeball out. Well, it's better for you to get control of your eyeballs, it, get control of your life. He, he said, it'd be better for you to cut your hand off. Well, it'd be better for you to take control of your members and to exercise control. So he, he's giving you a very um, ultimate type of description of how important this is, but I don't think God really wants you to cut your hand off. I think he wants you to control your hand because every bit of this has to do with free moral agency and free will. And if you don't overcome your will, it won't matter if you cut your hand off unless it's a constant reminder to you and it helps keep you straight. But you, you just need to grow. Continue to grow and you'll overcome that hand. Uh, continue to grow and you'll overcome that eye. If that hand keeps stealing stuff that doesn't belong to you, um, if you, the problem is not the sin. You gotta get this. The problem is not the sin. The problem is not the behavior. The problem is proximity to God because the closer you get to God, the fewer of those problems you're gonna have. The sinner's problem is not their sin. You can rail against their smoking and their drinking and their cursing and their drugs and their adultery and all of that. You can rail against that stuff, but that's not their problem. It's symptomatic of separation from God. So what's the answer? Be reunited with God. They need God. And as they find God, then God illuminates them and they see the error of their way and they begin to get better and they encounter the word of God and they go off and live happily ever after. So, so he's not suggesting that you, that you maim yourself or martyr yourself or disfigure or self-flagellate and because you can get off into that. I witnessed people in the Philippines on, uh, on the day before Easter, uh, walking in, uh, in processions, beating themselves, self-flagellating, or being beaten by others, and they were recreating the cross, and those individuals were feeling the need to suffer, the classic Catholic idea that if I suffer, then I can atone for my sins. Well. He already paid the price for our sins and he already took the whip and he already was nailed to the cross. And every year, those people are tied to, are nailed to crosses and some of them die out there in that heat uh, and from shock and from infection and from all sorts of different things. But they don't buy themselves a reprieve from God. You can't pay for your sins. He did. And his blood is the only thing that will atone for your sins. So don't, be thinking, well, if I hurt myself, cut off my hand, pluck out my eye. He's just telling you how important this is. But the, the heart of this is you have to get control of your will and you have to get yourself in compliance with the word of God. All right, a little further. It has been said, whosoever, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Now this comes as a shock to them. But I say to you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committed adultery. And I know the whole world around us divorces and remarries. And instead of the church being a leader in this, the church has begun to conform to this. When I was a child, if you met somebody that was divorced and remarried, it was like meeting a space alien. I was raised in a rural community in the deep south <coughs> and people just didn't get divorced even as late as the 1960s. But today, it's not only absolutely commonplace in the world, but it's commonplace in the church. But these teachings are absolutely, absolutely uh, the same, that remarriage uh, after divorce is, is adultery. There are some uh, preconditions that would, would inform that or change that, but the church, I, I think the most important uh, lesson here, the particulars are important, but this is a place where the world shouldn't inform the church, but the church should inform the world that when we take vows, we stand with those vows. 
You say, well, how serious are you about that? That's easy for you to say. I'm the one that was offended. You just tell me, and we'll go on with this conversation, but you tell me how many times has God forgiven Israel for adultery? What is the story of Hosea and Gomer about? It's about a, it's about a man that goes and takes a wife of the house of prostitution and marries her. And he said, that's me and that's Israel because Israel's always running after other gods and Israel's always in adultery. And how often does God take Israel back? And ultimately, what is the millennial about? It's God married to Israel and Israel, the center of the earth and God finally fulfilling all his prophecy and his promises. God never leaves Israel. If in, the, in Isaiah, where you say I've left you, where is the writing of divorcement? That's what God says. God doesn't believe in divorce. All right? That's the bottom line on this. And uh, so that needs to condition the entire, not only the, uh, the, the, the social cultural construct of the church, but the way that we approach it and in our families and in our homes and the way that we teach about these things. Because listen to me, as adultery, as divorce and remarriage becomes more common in the church, the marriage vow, vow will be less valued and less persisted in and you'll have more divorce until a pulpit stands up and takes a position against it. So, so we teach this at every, at every wedding and uh, we, uh, we talk about this in those terms. Uh, again, you've heard it said that in, uh, by them in of old time, thou shalt not swear thyself nor perform, uh, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou cannot make one hair white or black. Yea, let your communications be yea, yea, or nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these uh, cometh of evil. So, uh, and this is where we'll stop today. It's not as common for people to take vows and swear by things uh, today as it was then. But he's just, he's just telling you, watch your language, keep your Keep your language very simple. Don't put yourself into positions where you're, where you're taking an oath or vowing a vow and then you don't keep the thing. Uh, you notice how that follows right after a discussion of marriage. He says, if you take a vow, keep it. If you swear an oath, keep it. Where's the most common, the most prominent place where people swear a vow or take an oath today. It's in a marriage ceremony. And again, he's hammering that idea. If you do it, if you take a vow, you better keep it. If you take an oath, you better keep that. All right, it's been so good to study with you today. We'll move on next time to, uh, that'll be tomorrow morning uh, or this evening. Uh, as we recreate these studies for our archives. Uh, we'll be on Paul's teaching concerning spiritual warfare and the uh, armor of God. So it's excellent to be with you today. Mighty God, I pray your hand a blessing on all these that have gathered uh, on, on your people and in their homes and families. I pray that they prosper, bless them with the work of their hands, the way that they go, and all that they lay their hands to, that they prosper. And I pray that you would do it all in the name above every name, in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. All right, we'll see you next time.